Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and after pouring over the goblin condition, it's time to go over the other two colors of the stoplight rainbow, the hobgoblin and the bugbear. I'm gonna be talking all about the tribalistic ways of the bugbears, as well as the militaristic might of the hobgoblins, and it's all gonna lead into the final video that revolves around the whole host of all these goblinoid fellas. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this is just my opinion, so if you feel that hobgoblins shouldn't have lion faces, feel free to run your mighty goblin power rangers however you want. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So, starting off yellow, the life of the bugbear is actually not that complicated. Eat, sleep, rest, nap, and doze off. Bugbears are, in a word, lazy, and in two words, very lazy. Often grouping up into 80s gangs, bugbears spend their time not lazing around by bullying other races into giving them things and doing all their work for them so that they can continue to laze around and do nothing. Which is a shame, really, since bugbears are naturally both very strong and very stealthy, meaning that when they put their mind to it, a bugbear can get done any job worth doing. It's just that you have to convince them that it's actually worth doing. Their usual incentive for doing literally anything besides staying alive is to worship their twin bugbearian gods, Hrugak and Grankul, who are equal parts cunningly brutal as they are brutally cunning, as Hrugak supplies bugbears with their impressive strength and bravery, while Grankul gives them their stealthiness, but took away all their energy so that they never want to use their gifts unless they have to. The twins are absolutely devoted to each other's well-being, which feeds into the bugbear instinct to protect their own, and bugbears feel pride in having two awesome deities in their pantheon, the gift of stealth and forward-thinkingness separating them from the dumber orcs and the blundering ogres. When the bugbears feel that they need to give thanks to their big bros in the sky, they do so by taking the completely rational step of severing their enemies' heads and mounting them on spikes, which Hrugik and Grenkul will reward by turning those heads into magical alarm spells, or by having the heads rattle off any secrets that it knew in life. Granted, things aren't always good in the hood with the bug gods, and if the twins get mad, Hrugik will call down lightning either around or straight through a bugbear, and Grenkul will either blind his followers or just skip all the foreplay and straight up diagnose them with dead. So if a bugbear falls down in the forest and everybody's around to hear, that's how you know you fucked up. Of course, bugbears still have to worship Maglubiet, although Although the Big M, in a fit of brilliance, didn't kill the twin gods when he defeated them, but instead said, we are friends, and let them go about their lives, since he knew that saying, you work for me, would prompt them to say, fuck work, and do absolutely nothing. So when bugbears do inevitably join Maglubiet's conquering host, they aren't doing so because they've been forced into labor, they're doing it because somebody's messing with their boy Maggie, and those guys gotta get got. Lastly, bugbears have their own version of the boogeyman called Skigaret, the god of cowardice that triggers a bugbear's fight-or-flight response whenever they're in mortal danger. And hilariously, he only exists because bugbears feel the need to explain away any non-macho feeling that they have, and saying, a god did it, is easier than saying, I'm afraid. <laughs> I've always been afraid. And just in case you wanted to play your own not wimp in a campaign, bugbears get increases in strength and dex, dark vision, powerful build, a further reach with their weapons than normal, proficiency in stealth, and they get added damage on their first attack against anyone that they get the drop on at the beginning of combat. I mean, wow, this stat block is really good, especially for those people who want to be a powerhouse and still be stealthy, making it a pretty good representation of what a bugbear is meant to represent. So that's all there is for the bugbears, but let's move on to another race that, while definitely not lazy, also likes to hide all of its cowardly tendencies in a cloud of testosterone, the Hobgoblin. When when you first meet a hobgoblin, you might be confused. Despite the stories that they're crazed savages akin to goblins and bugbears, they're actually exceptionally polite, and you would be forgiven in thinking that this makes them nice people. In truth, hobgoblins are an angry, violent, warmongering race that wants nothing more than to monger as much of that war as they possibly can. Their overlaying hospitality is due to the way that all hobgoblins structure their life, with rigidity and precise intention. For hobgoblin, there is only war, and preparing for war, with small intervals of completing war and contemplating war in between. Their entire society is structured like a military, with every Every Hibbly Ghibli having their own rank, in order of importance, from soldier to fist, spear, fatal axe, captain, general, and warlord. Groups of hobgoblins make up what is called a banner, which is essentially a hobgoblin's immediate and extended family, and all the banners put together comprise a hobgoblin legion, their version of a tribe. And in this legion, every hobgoblin is expected to uphold the tenets that solidify every aspect of their life, these tenets being to always follow orders without question, always honor their god Namog Gaia, their god of leadership and stoicism, as well as their lesser god Bargivyek, the god of honor, discipline, and duty. Never allow an insult, both in the sense of never outwardly ridiculing anyone they see as lesser, which includes everyone, but also never allowing an insult directed at them to go unpunished, always reward glory to those who deserve it, regardless of the circumstance, and most importantly, uphold the honor of their legion at all costs, which is why when two hobgoblin legions meet each other, it almost always ends in hostility as soon as one legion decides to do literally anything, since it's an insult to call the shots when you are not the superior, and all hobgoblins think that they are superior. Luckily for the legions, hobgoblins tend to not travel unless they're 
in wartime, opting instead to find a plot of land and build a military outpost there, usually in a place where they can harvest the materials in the surrounding area for a while until it's all run dry, and where they can create forges and training grounds to keep their daily regimen of drafting regiments going. Impressively, when hobgoblins set up these sort of villages, they actually tend to create trading posts in front of them so that other species can communicate with them and trade without bothering the actual village at large, making them remarkably less parasitic than other monstrous races. That is, of course, until Maglubiot tells them that it's time to go killing again, and they all move to the town that was trading with them to ask politely for them to give all their stuff back and also murder everyone there. And to aid them in both conquesting and their inner daily life, hobgoblins have set up two elite specializations within their society that only those of high enough prestige can gain access to. Usually hobgoblins with blue or cherry red noses, since for some reason hobgoblins value those traits exceptionally highly. The first of these hidden agendas are the Iron Shadows, hobgoblins that took levels into the Way of the Shadow Monk and act as the hobgoblin hidden police and spy force, and when the time calls for it, infiltration troops. Their main purpose, however, is to look inwards upon the Legion, rooting out any insurrections, or especially any hobgoblins who would dare question Maglubiet's authority, to whom they hold the most allegiance, and stopping them before they can damage the stability of the entire host. On the other side of the coin, those hobgoblins with an unusual penchant for magic are sent to the prodigious Academy of Devastation, a place where hobgoblins are trained in the time-honored tradition of blowing shit up. Devastators are trained in offensive evocation magic, as well as defensive abjuration magic, and treat most other magics as completely unimportant, to the point where devastators don't really understand how magic works, they just know that if they move their hands like this and shout X, Y, and Z words, a big ball of fire will come out of their hands and solve all their problems. To them, knowing more about magic is superfluous when they already know everything they need to know, and they see it as akin to a fighter learning how to forge new weapons. Like, who cares? Just stick them with the pointy end and call it done. Of course, this makes them less versatile than you would expect a wizard to be, but honestly, wondering if the big scary red dude who's chucking fireballs at you can also sprout some good berries out of his pocket isn't going to be top on your list of priorities when you have to worry about, you know, his big red fireballs. Now, the last thing to talk about, of course, is the stat block of these martial devotees, and that comes in the form of a bonus to both common intelligence, dark vision, proficiency in both light armor and two martial weapons, and the unique saving face ability, which serves to exemplify the concept of the hobgoblin's instinctual aversion to dishonoring themselves by giving them a bonus to failed rolls once per short rest based on how many of the hobgoblin's allies are nearby. While not as passively useful as the bugbear's powers, being able to save face at the right moment is something that could potentially turn the tide of battle in your favor right when you need it most. So don't discount the chance to potentially guarantee rolls in a game that's so reliant on luck, lest you bring dishonor on yourself, dishonor on your family, and dishonor on your cow. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. The final part is going to go over all three of the super friends working together, and if you haven't seen the Gobbo Guide, it might lead you to some further insight about the other third of the Goblinoid trilogy. Remember to avoid doing your chores whenever possible, subscribe if you don't feel insulted, and maybe support me on Patreon to fund my private Goblinoid army. But yeah, Davy out.